Hi everybody and welcome back. This is Dr. Lefkoff here with the second installment of Intermediate uh, Macroeconomic Theory and uh, we're going to pick up where we left off in part one of this video segment uh, where we were solving the baseline solo growth model. So just to recall what we had done last time, uh, we had gone through, we had set up the model and we had imposed the steady state condition uh, which essentially said in the steady state capital per person should not be changing and then we solve for the value of capital in the steady state uh, to get the uh, K star as a function of the exogenous uh, parameters of the model uh, and then we could substitute the value of capital per capita in the steady state into our production function to get output and then we could substitute output into the consumption function to get consumption in the steady state. Um, so notice diagrammatically uh, here for um, given uh, the steady state value of capital which we find at the intersection of savings and investments. So this intersection defines K1. Uh, it's very easy to see how output uh, Y is split between investment and consumption in the steady state. Uh, and recall we concluded the last video series by noting uh, that as the savings rate changed, it actually moved us between different steady states. Higher levels of the savings rate S uh, moved us to a higher level of capital per person. Lower levels of the savings rate S moved us to lower levels of capital per person. Um, so here are three particular steady states. I'll refer to them as steady state one, two, and three. Um, but you can easily imagine uh, us considering all the possible steady states for all the potential savings rates, uh, which would fall along this red line. Um, and note that um, in the steady state, remember, depreciation is equal to investment. It's equal to the amount we're saving, which is why the capital stock is not changing. Um, so let's just go back and look at those three uh, steady states in particular and ask ourselves how much consumption do we get to enjoy in each of these steady states because um, remember again this is equal to savings in the steady state which means the value of consumption must just be the difference between output uh, and the savings in the steady state so here we can see these three different levels of consumption that correspond to these three different steady states and you'll notice uh, if you think about consumption, the ability to spend on, on consumables and goods and services is maybe a determinant of the standard of living that you get to enjoy. Um, perhaps society has a preference over these different steady states. Maybe the steady state that allows society to enjoy more consumption is maybe more preferred. Um, so it's pretty clear by looking at this diagram here that in steady state one, consumption is higher than in steady state two, which is larger than consumption in steady state three. So it seems like if you could choose between those three, you might want to choose steady state one, enjoy level of consumption of C1. Now recall, uh, we had found out already how consumption in the steady state depends on the savings rate. Um, so we could easily ask the question, what value of the savings rate actually gives us the maximum amount of consumption in the steady state? Uh, so essentially what we want to do is we want to solve um, this optimization problem where we're maximizing the consumption profile by treating the savings rate as almost like a choice variable. It's like a policy variable here. Um, so recall that the first order condition to maximizing uh, consumption with respect to the savings rate implies that the first derivative should equal zero at the optimum. Okay, so again, that's like we're asking, hey, which point on this red line is going to give us the largest consumption profile? Which point is going to give us the furthest distance uh, between the amount of output I'm generating and the amount I'm actually saving, right? Because the difference between those is the consumption profile. So you'll notice this, uh, this text box on the left-hand side here tells us exactly what we're trying to do now. I want to find the level of consumption that's the largest for any given steady state because that means at that steady state I'll be enjoying the highest standard of living. Um, so here is the uh, objective function in full detail and we're going to go through this very carefully step by step. Um, a little bit of a tedious algebra here, so I'm going to be very careful and go nice and slow. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to distribute um, the term in red here uh, into this 1 minus s term. I'm going to just rewrite the objective function a little bit. That'll make it easier for us to take derivatives later because I know a lot of people are comfortable with just using the power rule as opposed to maybe the chain rule or the product rule. Uh, so I'm going to first rewrite this. I'm going to distribute that uh, term in red into the 1 minus s. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to factor those two terms in red in that second line there. Okay, I'm going to factor them out. Okay. 
So you'll notice I, I've essentially taken this term here and I've pulled out all the parts of it that don't have an S, right? So these are this is just a constant here, that's just a constant there that's been factored out. And the next thing we're going to do now, since we have that common factor, let's factor that whole thing out. Okay, and in my very last step, I'm going to do just a, a little redefinition of the variables to make the math a little bit less messy in the next uh, coming steps when we have to do the calculus. And I'm going to define uh, this variable phi here, it's an uppercase Greek letter phi, uh, as this, um, this chunk of constant terms here, these constant parameters. So we're just going to remember from here on out that that term phi that we're going to carry around with us, uh, that is defined um, above analogously. Okay, so. Uh, what do we want to do? Well, we want to take the derivative of our objective function now with respect to s, which looks a little bit easier to do, a little bit less daunting, because we can just use the power rule here. Um, so we're going to take the first order condition, uh, which means we're going to take this partial derivative of c with respect to s. And you'll notice c was a function of other parameters, but I've dropped them since we're just interested in the effects of the savings rate for this exercise. Uh, now, the other thing you'll notice is that our constant phi is lumped into uh, the inside of this expression here. Okay, phi is a constant, so I could pull phi out and then take the derivative of each of those s terms individually. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Okay, so this third line here has the derivatives of those s terms in parentheses taken. So here was the phi that I pulled outside. Okay, that's a constant that just is going to float around when we take the derivative. And uh, here you can see in the third line, that is the derivative of the term above, right? I use the power rule, that power alpha over 1 minus alpha comes out front. Uh, just be very careful, check your math. This is the exponent here with 1 subtracted from it, right? So I brought the power out front, subtracted 1. Okay, and then we did the same thing for the second term. Right, so there was my power rule. And again, at the optimum, we have everything you'll notice set equal to 0 here. Okay, and then the uh, next thing we can do is actually we can divide through by this constant on both sides. The right-hand side is 0, let's divide through by phi. And the other thing we can do is actually multiply through by 1 minus alpha to get rid of those denominators. That also cleans things up a little bit here. Okay, and uh, then let's just add the negative term over to the right. And then the next step, I'm going to divide both sides by this right-hand term. Okay, so you notice on the right I should wind up with a 1. And then on the left-hand side, I'm going to have to just be very careful when I subtract these exponents. Okay, I'm going to subtract those exponents, so then on the left-hand side I actually wind up with an s to the negative 1 power. Okay, and uh, we finally find the optimal savings rate, and we get a very simple solution. that The optimal savings rate here uh, that maximizes the consumption profile is just equal to alpha. So the uh, next thing we want to do is kind of interpret this result. So we found the optimal savings rate. It's equal to alpha. And remember what alpha was. This was just capital share of income. Okay, um, so for the Cobb-Douglas technology, we just found out that the optimal savings rate for the economy to give us the highest standard of living is equal to uh, capital share of income. And we know for the U.S. economy, this is approximately 33% based on the data. Um, so now notice... Now that we know the optimal S star, we can plug this back into our steady state solutions of K, Y, and C, uh, which we had derived previously. And so all we're going to do now is go back to our original values. Everywhere I had an S, I'm going to substitute our optimal value of S, which we know now was alpha. Okay, so now what we found are the, uh, the steady state values of capital, income, and consumption in the steady state that allows us to enjoy the most possible consumption, the highest standard of living. Okay, so this is exactly what we had found here. Right? And of course, uh, you know, once we identify uh, the savings rate, we could just plot this savings function back in there to see exactly what the investment function looks like in that optimal steady state. Now, there is another way to go about doing this. It might be simpler sometimes, depending on what you're interested in. Um, it could be more complicated, but uh, let's just take a look. You re should recognize that we could have just looked at the production function and the investment function and looked at the value of k that gives the biggest distance. And it turns out the value that gives us the biggest distance between f and depreciation happens to occur at the point where those two functions have the exact same slope. Uh, recall the slope of the production function is just the marginal product of capital. So hypothetically, we could just take the marginal product of capital um, and set this equal to the depreciation rate 
and solve for k, and that should give us the exact same value of k in the optimal steady state we found that corresponded to that golden rule savings rate. Um, and in fact, you can verify that just going through uh, the math here, that we do in fact wind up getting the exact same result. And just be a little careful with your exponents here, but verify that we do get the exact same level of capital uh, in that optimal steady state that we had found last time. Um, so that's it for part two of this two-part installment on solving the, uh, the baseline solo growth model for the Cobb-Douglas technology.